And there it is. Good. All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for sticking with me, although lunch is kind of like, you know, almost happening. I know a lot of people are probably by now hungry and tired, but I'll still try to make it interesting enough to hopefully keep you entertained. Um, also, two little warnings. The first one is um, first time that's, that I ever tried this presentation. I mean, it's brand new, right? So this is, we'll see whether it works in the way that I envision. I hope so. Uh, and secondly, it may contain trigger words for some people. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that, how that plays out. Um, it might rather be uh, interesting. Also, you don't have to take a lot of notes. At the end, I actually have a very easy to consume um, way for you to get all the notes um, and all the further information and, and documentation, whatever you might want. Because for now, I really want to start with an overview of self-sovereign identity in particular, because to me, that's been a, it's, it's a topic that in a way has occupied me for a very long time now. In the last years, I've dedicated pretty much all my, my time to that. So about myself, does this work? Maybe, maybe not. Um, ah, it's turned off, yes. Have you tried turning it on and off again? Yes, perfect. Good. If we can now get the settings gone, we're good. Anyhow, so about myself. Uh, my name is Georg Greve. I am a co-founder of Verain AG. Um, Verain, the name, stands for Verifiable and Self-Sovereign. We founded the company 2017 in Switzerland with the idea of making self-sovereign identity useful and usable because identity lives in use cases and we need this to work for everyone. So we wanted to start actually exploring what we could do. We have a distributed team. Our two headquarters, if you will, is on the one hand in the Crypto Valley in Zug in Switzerland, which is where I am. And we also have a um, company in Sofia, um, Bulgaria, which is where our development team actually sits. I'm there every four to six weeks or so. And I think the last time actually I was at this conference in particular is when I was still with the Free Software Foundation Europe. Um, so it's a while ago. I mean, I, I, I've done that. Uh, it's, it's been a couple of years since then. But um, it's good to be back and, to, and thank you for giving me the chance to talk to you again. Now, let's get into this. Digital provenance. Now, provenance is um, the history, the totality of data, the, the aggregate, right, of everything that um, I mean, exists about pictures, for instance, right? We know provenance from things like, is this really a Rembrandt or a Picasso, right? Provenance is the, is the, the history of it, like who painted it, wh which stations did it make, did it get destroyed, modified, I don't know. I mean, all of this makes up provenance at the end of the day. Digital provenance is a term that I think describes very well what we create as part of our online life and identity because um, people in the old days were always making the difference between real life and digital life, right? Like real life and internet. But actually, digital is real. I mean, to most people, especially the younger generation now, there is no difference between, right? That it makes up who we are. Identity, our understanding of ourselves, of our own identity is formed by interactions and a very large number of our interactions today is online. It is digital. So um, we got to realize that digital identity is not some, some extra part, something that has nothing to do with us really, doesn't define us, we can just dump it or something. No, it's us. It's part of us. It's, it's an intrinsic, inseparable part of us. And your provenance is basically the totality of all that data, including, of course, data about your identity, but also things that you have done that somehow are attached to you and your identity. And in a way, it is what will be left when you are gone. We're also speaking a lot about security here, right? Security um, is, to a very large extent, a function of identity. Uh, this is from the open source 
testing methodology manual version three actually identification authorization are non-transferable right they're personal to you security controls and authorization depends on identification if you want to give someone permission to do something right the point is who are you giving permission to that, that's the whole point of it if there is no identification you have no access control so identity is extremely central not just to who we are and who we believe ourselves to be, it is also incredibly essential in how we interact with the world, right? What we are able to do in the world. So, I mean, very often when you talk about these kind of topics, right, people say, oh yeah, but you know, we're gonna do everything, you know, self-hosted and, and that will solve all problems. I have control of my data, I have control of my identity, I have control of all these things. Um, because it's all running on my own server. Now, yes, I, I actually am, am self-hosting some of my things, not all of them, and I do believe it's a good thing to do. And I do believe we should continue working on making it possible to self-host as much as possible. However, it is not the all-encompassing final answer to everything we do, right? It's not the be-all and end-all of everything we can do about this. First of all, because not everyone can do it, right? There is people who still struggle with the technical aspects of self-hosting and we can help them make it simpler and all these kind of things, right? That's all fine um, and we should, but for many use cases, it is still fairly technical to do these things yourself. It's not accessible to everyone. Not everyone has the means either in skill or in finances or I mean you have multiple restrictions that you need to overcome to be able to do this ultimately so it's not accessible universally that's what I'm trying to say and secondly and, and that, that may be a shocker but my next cloud may lie to you you know I may actually make up data as I need it to be made up to provide you with the data that I want you to have I mean, I can self-host for myself, that is cool. But as long as I want to interact with other people, I have the problem that I would need to know what went into the data that I'm receiving from a counterparty, right? If someone sends me data, I would need to know where the data came from, how it was generated, when it was generated. We all know, even digital signatures, right? It's not that hard to change the clock on your computer to generate a signature that looks like it was made a year ago. I mean, I assume everyone in this room would, would have no problem doing that. So the signature itself, cryptography alone, is not a solution, right? It's not solving this space entirely. We can make up data on the fly if we need to. Data is impossible to tell when it was created, right? We don't know when that data was actually generated. It claims it was generated yesterday, but is that true? We don't know. So actually, we didn't know until a couple of years ago, basically, or couldn't know. Um, the missing piece to all of this is basically a linear chronological oracle. An oracle that can tell us yes or no that data existed at this point in time. This data was real, was in exactly this state at that point in time. And here comes the trigger warning. This was the first actual production linear chronological oracle in the world. Um, now I know most people think of Bitcoin as an investment thing and maybe a Ponzi scheme and a bubble and whatever, right? Um, it, it, money, money stuff, right? Um, it's somehow money stuff. Um, but actually, Bitcoin is two things. One is a decentralized linear chronological oracle. There is, at this point in time, I checked the numbers yesterday, around 230,000 identified Bitcoin nodes, with, which have a full chain, of which around 15,000 are online at any point in time. They have the data set of this oracle, right, of hashes, of, of transactions, um, 
all stored on the local node, they can verify them, and they can make sure that a certain thing happened at a certain point in time. It generates about one block every 10 minutes, right? So with a 10 minute accuracy, I can guarantee you that data existed at that point in time. On a technical side, that makes it very, very valuable. Of course, some of those transactions, not all of them, some of those transactions are interpreted by the participants as reflecting a currency called Bitcoin, right? But from my view and understanding of the system, that's actually just a game theoretical aspect to pay for the security of the system, right? I mean, the system itself remains usable to anyone permissionless at any point in time to store hashes, mostly actually because we need to make it small and compact and hashes are very good at this, in order to be able to prove the existence of data at a certain point in time. Um, and one party that is doing this, by the way, is Microsoft. They are using Bitcoin as the hash chain for identity interactions over a protocol called SiteTree in a network called Ion. So in Ion, you can have verifiable credentials out of Microsoft Active Directory in, in Azure, right, in the cloud, um, and you can actually prove that this credential was created at a certain point in time using Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just a, an engine, it's like the, the, the transmission thing that, that cars had, right? There's this coordination belt that car, all the old cars had. I mean, basically, Bitcoin is just a technical system in that perspective. This had nothing to do with the currency in this case. It's a use case that is purely technical for identity, and they are storing the additional data that you need for verifiable credentials, and I'm gonna show you a little bit later what that is. They, they are storing that in IPFS for this particular system. And they have that in production today. They actually launched it last year, which is quite astounding, actually. So. And there's, of course, other blockchains and other people are trying to, to work with those concepts, and that's all true. But the first one that has actually taken this to production and is robust and solid until today and a very secure system, in fact, is Bitcoin, because it uses the game theory aspect to make itself secure. And if anyone were to try to m modify the chain in hindsight, there's 15,000 nodes online at any point in time that would immediately scream bloody murder. So it is highly decentralized, in fact. Now, where is that important? That is important in particular when you deal with sig signatures and cryptography. Because time stamping, the ability to prove a certain signature or a certain data set at a certain point in time is one of the primary functions that certificate authorities do. It's a very essential part of why they exist because Again, right, we, we didn't know how else to solve this problem. We need to know whether this data existed, whether the signature was really made two years ago or not. And the only way that we could come up with was to centralize this, right? We centralized this in certificate authorities. They are the sole harbinger of what is true and what isn't. Which, by the way, also means that they are a little bit like medieval monks in our society. Like, they had the power to sign for you, right? They were the only ones that could read and write, and they signed for you another contract. And if they have signed for you, you have signed. They have that power today. They are the equivalent of our medieval monks for trust anchoring in our digital society. That system sort of works, but we all know it doesn't work Perfectly, we've all seen the compromises and basically the way that CAs are trying to create that trust is through process, right? We have process to make sure no one does anything bad. And sure, you know, it, it does work to a certain extent. We don't know whether it's going to work forever, right? We don't know whether we can verify what they give us in 30 years' time because we don't know what's going to happen to the organization behind that, right? It's a single point of failure. And Quite frankly, it's a heavy process. I mean, it's a very heavy process. If you deal with CAs, it's typically not fun, right? They were trying to make it easier, yes, but when you see the spread of signatures and cryptography in, in broader society, it's not really universal. It's not like everyone does this all the time. And in fact, digital signatures in most countries, when you want to sign under a contract, are really expensive. 
I mean, if I want to sign a contract, I pay 50 cents per signature in Switzerland right now. Right? 50 cents. And you have a contract with 10 people. If, if I take just paper and a pen, right, it's much cheaper. So the digital world is actually nowhere near what we would want it to be there. And the other part that happened is, of course, when Snowden leaks came out, everyone realized, oh shit, we need to actually encrypt things on the internet. Um, and we realized that not everyone was getting certificates for their servers, which we could verify against CAs. People built Let's Encrypt right, as, as, a, as an answer to somehow get more encryption widely usable. And Let's, and Let's Encrypt is awesome. I'm, I'm using it myself. I'm a huge fan. However, it's again a single point of failure, sponsored by corporate interests in the US. Right? And that is by now encrypting more than half the web. I mean, so, so this one single point of failure is right now bearing the load of more than half our web traffic and keeping that secure. I don't find that necessarily perfect. I mean, it was the best we could do, right? But it's not ideal in my view. Now, the idea of, of self-sovereign identity came out of the understanding that somehow we needed something better. We wanted to create identity online that was actually secure and protected and under control of the user and would give us privacy and all these things that we want. And it's fairly recent, actually. So Christopher Allen is credited, rightly, I think, with first kind of crystallizing that down and creating basically what we in the free software world have with the free software definition, right, with our four principles, the 10 principles for self-sovereign identity. Existence, control, access, transparency, persistence, portability, interoperability, consent, minimization, and protection. And everything is a necessary requirement for it to actually be a self-sovereign identity. It being open source, by the way, follows naturally from this, right? I mean, it's, it, it, you must be able to look at the code. You must be able to verify every single bit of the system in order to be able to actually um, understand what is happening underneath, right? So we will see this in a sec. Everyone that is in this ecosystem, everyone that is participating here is actually building this as free software. Every single participant. What SSI allows us to do is actually create an ecosystem of identity provisioning, storage, and usage that is independent from one-to-one -one negotiation. Um, I mean, we all know these like sign in with whatever buttons, right? Um, the, these buttons exist because, I mean, it's usually OAuth under the hood, right? But they exist because whoever built that site said, OK, we are going to accept the identity of someone from Service X, right? But it also means our identity, our digital provenance, who, who we are actually lives with that provider, and that provider hears about it when we sign in here. Right? Because they get the request. But we sign in with Google there. Google knows that we're signing in there. They know where we are. They, they know who we're signing in with. Right? I mean, all this information is constantly being leaked. And in fact, today, I, this morning, I saw a, a new publication that said um, an average US citizen on an average day has 474 points in the day where their location, their identity, and their personal data is being shared with a data broker in the back. Um, in Germany, it's currently once every minute that you're online, roughly. So there's a constant surveillance built into the system in the way that we've architected the system. This is one of the primary things that SSI is actually designed to solve in the way that it's been architected. Because once you say, oh, I'm willing to allow SSI logins, it does not matter where 
that identity was ge generated, who it is with, which wallet you're using for your identity, whether you're self-hosting this or whether you're using a service provider, none of those things matter anymore. You can sign in with your identity whenever you want, wherever you want. The way that SSI achieves this is through a huh? ah, okay, cool. Through so-called verifiable credentials. So we actually have um, identity traits, right? Which means something that says something about you, like maybe you're the color of your eyes, maybe your your name, maybe your passport number, whatever it is, right? Something that identifies you that's personal to you. Um, you have this identity trait, right? There is a um, issuer of the verifiable credential that checks that this trait is actually true. I mean, you are an employee of company X, right? Your employer knows that. Um, your government knows what your passport number is. There's a, a multitude of entities that can issue verifiable credentials. These verifiable credentials are turned into a cryptographic form, right? And, and issued to you. You now have a document, I mean, it's not represented to you as a, as a piece of paper or anything usually, but it's, it's, a, it's a cryptographic document that says that party has verified that I am me, that I am employed here and that I am a citizen of this country. All these things become individual verifiable credentials which you aggregate into your own wallet which typically lives on your device, most often on your mobile phone and that you can now use with any third party to verify yourself or verify about yourself anything that you would want to share with that party in a way that you are 100% in control. The way this is represented to the user is you're connecting to someone over a protocol called DID.com. DID are the decentralized identifiers, basically. DIDs are, if you know Terry Pratchett, right, it's, it's not turtles all the way down, it's DIDs all the way down. They create like a tree structure that you can follow to, to get to the root of every single verifiable credential and claim. And DITCOM allows communication encrypted between two such endpoints. You connect to someone over your DITCOM protocol and they request from you, I would like to know your name or your passport number or whatever you know, for that use case may be useful. And you see the request and you can say yes or no. You get to choose, do I trust this entity? Do I give them this data, yes or no? And when you share it with them, whoever issued your credential does not get a report back. They do not get that phone home feature. It's your credential and yours alone to use wherever, whenever, how often ever, with whomever, your choice, your control. And you know what your data does and where it goes and who you're using it with. That is basically the idea behind self-sovereign, so sovereign, you are in control, identity. And I believe it's actually one of the most important things to work on because identity is linked with everything we do, as we saw in the beginning also. And this whole space is really fascinating right now. So um, it started in 2017 with the idea, right? People started to um, develop this idea and standardize this idea because the only way that you can get a ecosystem is you need to build on standards together, right? So normally we build a solution and then we kind of figure out the standards. In this case, we had to start standardization very, very early on. So we've spent 2018, 19, 20, very much on standardizing all these things and making sure that, you know, we actually have a common language to speak. Um, this happened in the W3C, which is where um, of course, as we all know, HTML and, 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 and things around that are, uh, are standardized, but also the decentralized identifiers are specified in the W3C. That's where that specification lives. And there's a decentralized identity foundation that has built things like DITCOM and other higher layer protocols on top for this. So W3C is a little bit the more simpler parts that verifiable credentials and, um, and DIDs and DITCOM and somewhat more complex things like SiteTree, which is what is underneath Ion. All these things were built in the DIF. 
And on that technical standard now, you have multiple countries working toward building their identity systems for this. Canada was one of the first because they were actually very close to this whole, whole sphere. Like several of the key actors were in Canada. So they had immediate contact with health system and other natural users for that kind of system. And they started to build that out and try it out very early on. Um, Hyperledger Indy is in fact created for that use case. And now we're pulling out that cryptography from Indy into another library, which is Hyperledger Ares, all happening under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation in order to provide us a generic SSI framework that everyone can use. In Europe, we have Gaia-X, which is this idea to create a European sovereign cloud, right? to make Europe less dependent on very large um, mega clouds. But this will only work if we have an identity, which is why we're building um, SSI for Gaia-X. In fact, that's what I do right now with my team. We're working on the personal credential manager and the organizational credential manager, as well as the trust services API for Gaia-X as part of a bid from the German government. So there's a lot happening in this field, and it's happening faster than in almost any other field that I've seen. I mean, we expect the first functional wallets, the first actual use cases within the next 12 to 18 months. We're actually really, really much faster than in almost any other field, and we're already pretty far. And the point that I really, really want to leave you with is the understanding that this, the principles of self-sovereign identity, the idea behind what self-sovereign identity gives us is actually the identity of what we, as a free software, as an open source community, um, have been working for for so long. Right? I mean, self-sovereign identity is ultimately software freedom identity. The principles behind this, right? the ideas behind it are not only based on our work, they're innately compatible with everything we do and help us to build what we actually are trying to achieve as a community. At least that's my understanding of it. So if you have not yet looked into this, I highly encourage you to dig a little bit into it. I mean, there's some good books about it, there's some very good um, uh, documentation about it, good articles. Like I said, I've assembled a, a couple of things for you. And all you need to do is actually scan this QR code, which is, um, I, I, I snatched this out of my mail client because um, this is a very an open verifiable credential for email that we've built, right? And you will see that it actually, on any device, calls up the actual data for you, and you can then go through it, see what you like in there. I've just sent it as an email to myself because it was an easy way to share all of this and make it very easy for you to not only have my contact data, but also all the additional data that I have for you. And that's what I had to say. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, is this in any way uh, connected with this European Commission uh, ID thing that is now in yes. the talks? Um, I didn't go into that, but so we have the EIDAS framework, right, in the EU. Um, it regulates, among other things, how digital signatures are being made. And which is, the, I mean, being able to sign a document is one of the most important use cases that we have that is still not working properly. And they're right now reworking re AIDAS in order to um, have AIDAS support fully SSI. Because AIDAS version one was built really for CA approach, right? Um, but the new version of AIDAS is explicitly with the goal of fully supporting SSI as uh, according to those 10 principles, as Gaia-X is also implementing it. So all of this is happening in parallel right now, which is why once that AIDAS um, law is through, it will be possible to do qualified electronic signatures, so the highest level of trust kind of signatures, using SSI. Maybe then an additional sub-question. Uh, 
There is, a, I would say, there is a critique right now on the idea of the new version of the EU ID and the wallets, uh, that, it, it, that it is not decentralized enough. Uh, I, I, I don't know the details, I just uh, read like a summary of, of the current uh, comments. Do you have any? Well, I mean, I would need to see the criticism in order to be able to respond to it. Um, what I know is that what we are building right now, I mean, we actually, the, 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 part, the team that is building this right now, but what we are building is 100% built for decentralization, right? It's, it's just a, I mean, you have the, the three components that we have. The personal credential manager is basically an application for your phone. Right, most importantly. Um, so you're on your phone, you have your, 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 your local keys you have that never leave your phone, and you have your verifiable credentials that you aggregate in your local phone, and with that you interact with other parties. On the organizational credential manager, so the companies, right, that's basically a service that any company can run, and it hooks up to the directory service of the company to de determine who is part of this team, right? who's part of this company, because no company in the world wants to create a new directory service. Right? They, no one wants to touch that. That part is working. We, sort of, we know how that is all happening. We don't want a second point of administration. So that's why we're hooking straight into whatever exists there. And the Trust Services API is kind of like a middleware and cache underneath. And it's a pure in-memory cache, actually, by design, where we can resolve the IDs, we can get the documents, we can uh, extract what information they have, verify the keys, verify transactions against the blockchain, and we keep the state of, of that data in memory just for purely efficiency purposes, basically. Right, so those are the components that we are working on, and every single one of them is intended to be used by one party, right? single party use. There is no central party for any of this. What I do know what GaiaX is doing as an association is they are currently looking into how do we translate the old system into this new system. So they're thinking of creating a service that would allow you to, to have a classic CA style signature translated into a verifiable credential that can be used in the system and they would potentially be the party to attest to the fact that yes, this has been verified as correct. When we looked at this, it was okay. Um, and I mean, someone needs to take that service role as a service function in this ecosystem. And it's, for me, it's not a problem that GaiaX does it. It's a natural choice. But they're also not the only one that could do this, right? Once the software for this, which is all free software, um, is there, right? Anyone can do that service. And there's no reason why it wouldn't be governments doing that, that, that function, why it wouldn't be associations for certain sectors maybe doing that for their areas. I mean, we just need to bridge the old to the new somehow because we live in a hybrid world for a while. Um, so, but I, I mean, that's as far as I, as I know about it. There's otherwise nothing that I know particularly about um, anything being centralized, actually. Um, although, of course, uh, the communication, I mean, I, I find it not always ideal, right? Sometimes I'm thinking communication could be improved because there's sometimes people who, are, who grew up in a different world who are now trying to address this, and sometimes they say things in ways that can easily be misunderstood. So maybe that's behind it, I don't know. Yes? Has there ever been a practical use of distributed databases before? before this because they've been distributed databases yeah but i mean it's not really a distributed database right because i mean it's a it's a linear chronological oracle it's a it's that's a mouthful i know but um, it's not really a database. I mean, of course, you c could, in theory, stuff data in there. You could do like key value storage in, in this, right? But it's not really efficient at that. It's good at one thing. It's a one-trick pony in that regard, right? It is good at one thing and one thing only, which is to make sure I have very, very hard trust in the fact that certain data existed at a certain point in time. Um, that's the one thing it does. Um, everything else that gets built on top of it Right, is, is additional layers, is additional functions, and these do not necessarily connect to what you understand as a blockchain, right? I mean, yes, you can build higher layers on top of it, sure, and people do that, right? Starting with like the idea of building smart contracts and using IPFS for, for external data storage, and, but these are all 
owns like their own systems in their own right. They all have their own technical capabilities and limitations. And when you are thinking about architecting solutions, right, um, you have different components to choose from. And very often, because blockchain is so slow, right, I mean, it's not super efficient. I mean, it has a hard problem to solve. It solves that problem, but it's not super efficient in speed. So what you do is you build um, layer two caching on top where you, for instance, aggregate hashes into either a hash tree or, or I mean, you, there's multiple ways of doing this ultimately, but you can aggregate that data into a, in term, in, so you only have to one hash to write, not 50 or something like this. Um, there's a couple of things that you can do or people build like lightning on top of Bitcoin, right, where they do, there's a payment system and they can do thousands of payments and, and basically settle them in a single block. Um, these kind of things exist because there's limitations in the underlying infrastructure. Um, I do not know of any other technology that solves this particular problem. Um, is this technology the best choice for every problem? No, of course not. No technology is. On. Well, in that case. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sticking with me. And now let's go.